Uh, I'm Colin Jones. I'm the CEO for the Society of Photographers. Excellent. It's lovely to see you as always, Colin. Uh, tell me why you come to the photography show. Oh, the photography show is a, a great show. It's great to meet up with uh, all the, the trades, seeing all the latest products and services in the industry uh, and getting to network with other photographers. It's a great show to come to. So tell me why you love this industry so much. Oh, I love the industry. I, I've always been part of the photography industry. It's been part of my family since my granddad and my dad. And it's a, an industry full of amazing people, creative people, uh, and, you know, with so much passion for, for, for photography and for the craft of it. Uh, and I love seeing people excel in the industry as well. So that's all of the positives. But if, like everything, there are always things we could do better as an industry. If there's one thing, just one thing that you could change in this glorious passion of ours, what would it be? I think I'd like to see photographers get more training, invest more time in training and more, more money in training. Uh, you know, I see when we see people what, take that step and really invest in training to push not only their photography, but their business. We see so much success. Uh, so I'd love to see training be more forefront. When you're talking about training, what aspects do you think photographers in the industry, certainly the industry we spend most of our time with, which is the UK industry, what do you think is the weak spot? Wh which direction do you think the development would be most applicable? I think uh, quite a lot of photographers, if they're in business, uh, that's where we see a lot of photographers really struggle, getting clients through the door, marketing their services. Uh, so that's, that's always been a big passion of mine is getting photographers more training in the business side. But, you know, I, I genuinely think training of any kind, whether it's lights and imposing, or even just networking with your peers uh, and getting trained in that way just by talking to other photographers uh, is, a, is a real bonus. Excellent. Perfect answers, as always, from one of the nicest guys in the industry. Thank you, Colin. Ah, so that is one more of those little interviews I did at the photography show earlier this year. That was Colin Jones, the CEO of the Society's of photographers it's always interesting talking to people like colin i mean not just because he's a really lovely guy but he hears from hundreds possibly thousands of photographers uh on a scale that most of us can only imagine and yet the themes still seem to be consistent it's all about education and learning i'm paul and this is the mastering portrait photography podcast <laughs> Well, it's been three weeks since the last episode. And yesterday, yesterday was mine and Sarah's 21st wedding anniversary. She sent me a card and it simply said, imagine how boring life would be without me. <laughs> Literally, in quotes, imagine how boring life would be without me. Well, this morning, she bit my toe. I was fast asleep. She bit my toe. Now, I sleep with my feet out of the bottom of the duvet. I've always done it, and I've no idea why, but I do. This morning, she bit my toe. And this isn't really a unique event. I think she probably does it a few times a year. I'm asleep, then rudely, I'm awakened with pain. There is nothing in between those two moments, except a searing sensation that someone has sunk their teeth into my big toe. I don't really know which bit hurts the most, the initial bite or the moment I react and pull away, leaving tooth marks. This morning, she bit my toe. <laughs> it's true. Sarah is right. Imagine how life would be without her. Imagine how boring it would be. Frankly, I can't imagine it. I can't picture how things would be without every morning there being the risk that she's going to sink her teeth <laughs> into my toe. But Sarah's the person who makes me laugh the most. She is the person who allows the extrovert in me out. She's the person who props me up when I'm down. And she's the person who keeps a lid on me <laughs> when I'm up. <laughs> that sounds really weird. But you get the gist of it. Um, you know, I can be quite full on, I think. And it's Sarah that just keeps things nice and steady. And so... Thank you, Sarah, for 21 years of marriage, 33 years of hilarity between the two of us. So, yes, life would be really boring without her. Anyway, in the past three weeks, what has happened in our diary? Well, there have been 22 different portrait sessions, which is lovely, including one uh, just this morning. Beautiful family. Uh, so a mum with her two children and her two grandchildren. 
Um, just lovely out in the sunshine a quick drive over to their house a shot in the garden what was funny about it was every single shot she wanted a front door in the images which uh, I've had sort of you know big manor houses and different things have had to be part of a shoot but I've never had one where the front door has to be prominent but it was a joyous shoot beautiful people they made me very welcome cannot wait to show them their pictures and one of the two little girls she's three years old was wearing a liverpool fc football strip now on two levels that just filled my heart with joy on the one level it's liverpool which happens to be the team that i also have always supported all my life i've supported and when i say supported what i mean is occasionally i've looked at the headlines and seen the score or occasionally you know a key match comes up and i might watch the first 20 minutes of it before it gets way too stressful for me and i leave the room i'm not really a supporter in the supporter sense of the word but if i'm ever if ever i'm asked and this is since i've been about five years old it's been liverpool and she was wearing a kit this morning and the kit was almost identical to a kit I was bought for Christmas when I think I was about eight. There's something about the styling of the current the current kit, the red with the white collar, the, the cut of it, the styling of it, that's almost exactly the same as it was all of those years ago when it was Kevin Keegan and the boys playing. Uh, so that made me happy. But the, the main reason it made me really happy is isn't it amazing or is it amazing or isn't it about time maybe it's about time maybe we're just getting there that a girl turned up at the door she's three years old and she's a football fanatic and i know now the way it will be for her is so very different than for instance if my sister when she was that age wanted to play football now my my sister because i was a drummer my sister wanted to play drums but the girl school she went to said that wasn't ladylike how heartbreaking is that? I mean, we're going back quite a long time, but how heartbreaking is that? That you can't do something because it's not ladylike. You can't do something because because of your gender, it doesn't fit in. It's just ridiculous. And so it is so heartwarming this morning to see this little girl in a bright red, bright red Liverpool football strip, kicking a ball around the garden and loving every single second of it and unlike my sister where i think life you know that particular time in the late 80s early 90s you know societies it was sort of prevented things like that i know this little kid that won't be the case for her or at least i trust it won't be the case for her so a wonderful shoot this morning 22 portrait shoots over the past three weeks we've done five hearing dog shoots uh, two of those have been out on uh, location and they've been so joyous so profoundly joyous um the one yesterday was of one of our recipients whose hearing dog has essentially been a lifesaver i mean i i hear this quite a lot but i really do think uh, the lady I photographed with her dog yesterday, she's in her mid-20s, um, is just was just an inspiration, really. The relationship with the dog, the way they were, the joy the dog has brought. Um, and it was just a magical shoot. And one of the things about these, all I mean, all portrait shoots, I think, but in particular with shoots like the hearing dogs, is as much as I'm providing a service, as much as I'm providing images that they can use for fundraising and publicity and PR and marketing and all of these things is they provide me with a sense of what's the right word they energize me they give me energy and positivity I come away from these shoots so much more full of life than I do when I arrive at them I just think it's, it's just incredible the joy that uh, photography can bring not just to the people I'm photographing but also uh, to me. Uh, we've had five... That was a bit abrupt. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe I just couldn't think of a good point to wind up on. But being a portrait photographer is a thing of joy. It is a thing of life. It is a thing of positivity and energy. Um, and I suppose that's what I'm trying to get to. It really is something. But it's not a one-way street. I get as much energy and joy out of these shoots as my clients do. Uh, we've also had five client reveals. 
uh, just wonderful. I love it when a client's come to see their images. We're never quite certain what we're going to sell, but uh, it's just a lovely thing to see the reaction of people when they see their pictures. Sometimes surprise, in fact, nearly always surprise at how beautiful the pictures can be. I don't know why they're surprised. They've come to us. They've come to us because they've seen what I can do for others. Um, and yet still the surprise. Very often it's clients who've been to us before and they're still surprised. <laughs> Maybe I should work harder at explaining what we what we do. But that element of surprise is a lovely thing when it's down in the, in the reveal room. And tomorrow we've got a little wedding. It was just a two-person wedding uh, who are coming to see their uh, pictures. And again, massively looking forward to that. Uh, we've run one one-on-one -on -one masterclass. I love the one-on-one -on -one masterclasses because, of course, every topic, every topic can be on the table. We don't need to worry about uh, suiting or fulfilling the requirements of four or five people. It's just one person and we can play, we can talk, uh, we can jump between different topics, we can try different things out depending on their needs, anything from business all the way through to how to prep your files for photoshop it doesn't really make any difference to us and so for that it's just a wonderful thing to do we've also done uh, an off camera flash workshop now the off camera flash workshops are by far the hardest <laughs> even this morning at a little shoot um when i met bumped into the little girl uh in her liverpool outfit liverpool kit I decided one of the shots we would do would be uh, like a FIFA or UEFA uh, footballer's pose because all footballers are contracted to do these things so that when uh, the, the the TV companies roll out or, or show the team list or whatever or feature a player, there's footage of every player walking into shot and standing a very particular way. They're lit a very particular way. Um, and you can do that quite happily out in the garden with some off-camera flash. So even this morning, I was using off-camera flash and you have to sort of pause a little bit and think, okay, and you, you have to build the shot setting by setting. Then it's not as straightforward as it is just using TTL. You could just use TTL on your flash guns, uh, but you'll get sort of slightly erratic results if you do that. You have to understand how uh, the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, they all interact to give you the output you're looking for. And this morning, absolutely nailed it. But when you're trying to teach it, trying to get those principles across in a way that is clear, a way that is concise, and a way that is repeatable so that your delegates can leave and use that, those techniques themselves isn't trivial. It's the, of all the things we teach here at the studio, I think it's the hardest. And I know it's the hardest because when I'm suddenly faced with having to get the settings right for myself on a shoot, invariably I'll change the wrong thing at the wrong moment and it's like, oh bugger having to go back and figure it out uh so it was it was lovely to do a brilliant day lots of laughter and one that Sarah was away for so thank you to Katie and James who stepped in and Katie stepped in in the role of of Sarah because she had to go and look after my in-laws new puppy for eight days honestly she's come back exhausted that that's Sarah that is not the puppy uh, she's come back absolutely exhausted the puppy goes to sleep at midnight the puppy wakes up at six and there's very little in between <laughs> it's on and off uh, and it's on from 6 a.m to midnight and it's off from midnight till six she was absolutely shattered so uh, she was away the week when we were running the workshop, unfortunately, and couldn't be helped, not a lot of sidestepping. But Katie, thank you very much for stepping in and being sort of a surrogate Sarah and helping me make sure that everything ran uh, smoothly. Uh, also, this last week, we have done a full day of qualifications judging for the BIP, the British Institute of Professional Photography. Um, it's a wonderful thing. Qualifications are such an amazing thing to be a part of. And I mean that from both sides of the line. I, I kind of draw inspiration from the candidates, the people putting their images in for assessment, and I draw inspiration from the judges, but in very different ways. The candidates, of course, it takes quite a lot of bravery, I think, to submit your images. I mean, we've all been through it, but it still is quite a thing to do to submit your images in for assessment as qualification because you don't know, you don't truly know, even the mentors don't truly know whether a panel is going to be successful or not. We did eight panels in a day. I'm chairing it, so I'm not really a judge in the, in that sense anymore. 
I chair it and make sure it's run smoothly. And the process is meticulous in the way we do it so that it's fair and equitable for every single candidate. Firstly, the candidate sets up their panel and the, the judges get to assess the images. At the end of that first assessment, we take a vote, then have a discussion, and then we take a second vote. And the reason we do it like that is so that the judges get to make up their minds independently with no influence. They're just assessing the images on their own in, on an individual basis. Then we vote and then there's a discussion. And in that discussion, it's about the judging team, the panel of judges arriving at a decision that is a combination of their own independent view and the views of the other four judges. And it's important that it's done like that because every judge has a different experience, different influences and skills for how they assess the images. And so when the judges talk, each judge gets the opportunity to address the panel and talk about why they think their decision is the right one. But they're also listening to the other four judges and taking into account maybe things they haven't noticed or maybe things that they just don't prioritise quite the same way. And listening to these six judges, or five at a time, but the six judges in discourse, listening, giving their views, knowing when to be brave and when to stand their ground, but also knowing when to flex and acknowledge that maybe another photographer, another judge has more experience in an area or has spotted something that they haven't. That, that was exhilarating in the extreme because the panel of judges, each time there was a discussion, they came to a decision and the whole panel, it doesn't have to be unanimous, but the whole panel of judges respects and understands the outcome of the process. Now, of course, the delegate might not. <laughs> that is, or the candidate rather might not. That is true. And it wasn't 100% pass uh, in terms of each of the panels. And it's always heartbreaking. I wish the candidates could see behind the curtain while we come to the decision. That's not part of the process that we've opened up just yet. Um, that may come in the future as we get our arms around a way of doing that that is uh, fair. But genuinely, when a, a panel was unsuccessful, you could almost hear everybody in the room. You could almost hear their hearts breaking. When we say we're sorry, we mean it. Because we would love every single panel to be a successful panel. We would love that. But in the end, it's a, it's a balancing act between making sure that we reward the endeavour, we reward the work, but the standards have to be high. They have to be consistent. They have to be something that when people look at the letters you put on the wall, they mean something. And sadly, they can only mean something if we hold our ground on uh, the standards, the process and the reasons why certain panels will succeed where other panels may not make it this particular time. But what an absolute, what an absolute privilege to be in the room with those judges looking at those panels. The panels were stunning, even the ones that were unsuccessful this time round. The panels were stunning. So a huge thank you to the six judges who came and provided their skills, their eyes, their experience to assess each of the candidates' work. And what a beautiful thing to be a part of. Um, what else? What have I written in my notes? Oh, yeah, I've drank a little too much this week and exercised a little too little. <laughs> That's something I'm now feeling very guilty about. And this afternoon, it's Saturday afternoon, and I sat and thought... Shall I go home and get on the exercise bike or shall I record a podcast? And I thought, oh, <laughs> I better record this podcast. But trust me, when this is recorded, I'm going to go home and do a little bit more exercise than I have this week. This week, I've barely slept. I've been working in London. I've been working in Essex. I've been working here locally. This stuff has had to go out. I've written an article for Professional Photo Magazine. Big shout out to those guys, by the way. The online magazine looks fantastic. That's Professional uh, Photo Magazine. Uh, but what uh, what a week it has been. Uh, final note, final note this week. Um, it's been a real run of it just at the moment in that lots of photographic suppliers have been approaching us 
to feature their product on either the podcast or Mastering Portrait Photography or just getting it into our hands so that we can talk about it. And I have a really strict policy here um, that I will only talk about things and promote things that I use, that are part of our business, part of our workflow. Because if they are worth talking about, then trust me, I've already had a look. I'm already using it. So this one, this came in yesterday um, and I'll put the link in the show notes. We use a bit of software or we've been exploring a bit of software called Evoto, E-V-O-T-O, which is, it's an AI retouching package. Now I know I can feel a few of you hackles going up, blooming AI, (laughs) retouching, automated and all of those things. Why do I like it? Well, I like it because you have total control. So in the same way that we use actions in Photoshop, we put up um, check layers and do dodging and burning. This takes some of that drudgery out. I say drudgery, that, sorry, that sounds dreadful. I don't mean it to sound like that because actually I love retouching. I love it when I've got an hour and a beautiful picture that I can just work up. But my business model doesn't allow me to do that for 22 portrait shoots in three weeks. It just doesn't. Now I could outsource it, I suppose, but I've never been really that happy with the results when I've done that. I I find things come back just looking a little bit plastic. Um, Of course, I could pay really high-end retouches, but I work in social photography, not commercial retouching. Obviously, if it's going to be the cover of Vogue, I can spend thousands on a single image being retouched. But that's not my world. My world is a very solid, very dynamic, very successful social photography uh, outfit. And although I like the images to have a really high fashion look for an awful lot of my work, trying to find techniques to do that quickly is not straightforward. Um, So when Evoto suddenly emerged... Uh, a few months ago it's still sort of in beta at least a lot of the functions are Um, it's evoto you can go download it Um, this particular piece of software allows you a huge amount of control and there are two bits of photoshopping that i really don't enjoy i I don't mind i love i say i don't mind i love skin retouching i love working up the colors i love all of that side of it i really don't like fixing crossed hairs and I don't like fixing crease clothes. Those are two things, and there are, there are others, but those are two things I really just find irritating for whatever reason. Well, Evoto, on its own, it would be worth the effort of just fixing those. Um, it does crosshairs brilliantly, and it will take the majority of creases out of pretty much any type of clothing. And even if that was all it did, that would be worth the money. But it does so much more. It helps me... In so many ways, it's helping us automate and create a higher finish, but it's still looking natural, still looking like they, the images haven't been retouched. I'll do a deep dive into it at some point, uh, but the guys have been in touch, and I do have a promo code. Uh, if you fancy it, again, I'll, say, I'll put that in the notes, but it's https colon slash slash go dot evoto dot ai slash paul wilkinson capital p capital w all one word paul wilkinson and if you go there and sign up uh, you will get 30 free credits which allow you to have a play so you'll get 30 free credits the other thing about the software which i really like is that you pay to finish the image so you can load it up with as many images as you like and run your your settings on it and run you know basically all of that the whole of the software but you only get charged when you export the finished images out now it's not perfect yet uh, it only works on certain types of files it won't work on psd files it works on tiffs or raw files uh, or jpegs but trust me it's an absolute godsend uh, particularly if you don't overuse it if you just keep on the right side of the line The images look natural, they look polished, they look finished. You've got no crossed hairs and even the clothes can get a little bit of an iron. So I'll put that link in the show notes. And if you follow the link, you will get uh, 30 free credits. By the way, I get no kickback on this. I'm getting nothing out of it. (laughs) It's just I talk to the guys because I use the software. And I said I would happily uh, promote it because I think it's It's absolutely uh, brilliant. And anybody, the whole point of this podcast is to make life a little bit easier for anybody uh, doing portrait 
uh, photography. So anyway, on to what is, I suppose, as much as it ever is the topic of a podcast. These are just, you know, it's the diary of a working pro and stuff that occurs to me as we as I get on with life. Um, but here's the primary topic of this particular uh, podcast. And in a sense, it's a little bit of a moan. I just I don't like to moan. It's not my style. But this is just a little bit of a protest. Protest sounds better than moan. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of a protest, which is the sheer number of adverts I get in all of my social feeds with people telling me they have the answer. They can make my photography business successful. They can find me thousands of clients. They have a six-figure photographic business. They can tell me how they did it. No one, no one has the answer. It's all lots of small parts. And when I'm looking for help, I look basically for three three things, more or less. And these, these are three things that it would have to have if I'm going to use someone for some help. Firstly, do I admire their pictures? Do I admire their pictures? Do I want or understand why they create what they do? Is it something that's in tune with me and what I want? A couple of people have come into our studio and said, well, you could do it like this. You could turn the whole space into two working studios, have two photographers in each, run eight shoots uh, in each uh, part of your space per day. That's 16 shoots per day you need to get a sales team onto the calls do cold calling do lead generation and you could run a multi-million pound business yeah well, well i could but i don't want to <laughs> because those photos are not the photos that i want to take um, and besides i want to take them i love creating pictures that's part of why we do this the idea of not creating pictures anymore is not part of my business plan what I've got to always figure out is how to make this business as profitable as I can. Given the caveat, I left a very well-paid job in the city to do it. I left a career and a life of money and shares and shareholder value and watching stock markets and being a partner in a firm. I left all of that behind me because it wasn't what I wanted. What I wanted to do was create beautiful images and make life just a little bit better for people, myself included. Um, so the, the idea of doing that... so. I will only ever look for someone who's creating pictures that I truly admire. Secondly, does their business, the business they're describing, does it look like my business vision? So whatever it is they're trying to sell me, is that part of my vision? And thirdly, do I like the person who purports to give me that information? If those three things are true, then maybe I'll dig into it a little bit further. But if any one of those isn't true... I'm not going there. And I get so many ads with people waving their camera around, telling me some number or other, you know, I don't know. I've created a six-figure business in three weeks. Um, I did it all from the comfort of my own home. I mean, there's even ads now I get that tell me that you don't need a photographer. <laughs> you can set up a headshot business without ever using a photographer. And if I get one more of those ads from someone who clearly doesn't understand what personal branding really is it's, the clue is in the title personal <laughs> it's not ai generated i know you can change hairdos and suits and i use ai everywhere trust me but there's a big difference in that if you think about the one word you have to have in personal branding authenticity is at the heart of it and ai can't give you that i mean it, it, you can't synthesize authenticity there's no such thing Synthetic authenticity is an oxymoron. It is not a thing. <laughs> it's either authentic or it ain't. So uh, I'm sort of very, uh, very cynical about all of those things. And, they, and these people are always waving a camera around at me, sometimes with the lens cap still on. I assume that it's because the meta or social media algorithms reward people waving a camera around. So it gets it higher up in my feed. And it definitely works as long as it's aimed at me <laughs> so i've got hundreds of these things and they're always there is a very particular type of person they're always very bouncy and extrovert and energetic and i like that i'm bouncy and energetic and extrovert um but i'd like to know that their business has been running for 10 years or 15 years i'd like to know that they consistently do these pictures with real clients the kind of clients that we find the kind of clients that are in tune with our business um now, of course, when I dig into them and actually have a hunt around, 99% of them are paper thin. There's nothing underneath. There's no, it's not substantiated by any real world business acumen or business experience. 
Some of them will have been successful, but you can feel that they are now going into training because the success of the business is probably beginning to wane. I'm looking for a long-term sustained business if what I want to run is a long-term sustained business. I'm looking for somebody who can do what I want to do. Um, now, it is true. It is true that you can be a great coach without being a sporting star on your own or a vocal coach to rock stars. They're not quite the same thing. Being good at something and being at a coach in it, are not quite the same thing as being a star in it. I understand that. But I really do want to know that the war stories I'm going to learn from are real. That someone's been out there, someone's done it, that they've walked the walk and ideally are still walking the walk. I'd much rather learn from a business than from a trainer, if you get what I mean. I want to go to a consultant who's still running that business. They're still learning. They're still evolving. I mean, goodness knows, in the UK, we're about to go into a general election the dates of that have just been released. And if there's one thing I know about elections and anything sort of like um, referenda, anything like that, is the phones just go that little bit quieter. So no matter what happens up until July the 4th, which is the election day, I know that the market will be ever so slightly suppressed because people don't wake up during election campaigning and think first as they wake up, I need to get some photos. That's just not what happens. People wake up and think, you know, what's Rishi Sunak said today or where are we headed with the election or any one of a million other things. But photography just gets down the list a little bit further. So I know we're about to go into a quiet period. And what I want is someone who's been through that, knows that's what's coming, knows that the little intricacies of running a business over a long period of time are far more than you can do something like this in 42 days or in just three weeks you can have this success or with just one camera and one lens and working from home you can telemarket to a thousand people. I don't care about any of that. What I want to know is do they run a business that looks a little bit like mine and I know that they've been there, seen it, done it and are still doing it. Um, now, a couple of episodes ago, I talked about four things, four things that I think are consistent to successful photographers. That's energy, optimism, enthusiasm and confidence. I stand by that. <laughs> they're very much there, but they're not all of it. And I did say that in the podcast. They're just the foundation stones. They're not the whole building. They're the bit, they're the bedrock or the foundation that everything can be built on, but they are not the whole building. Maybe I'll get over the coming months to talk about each of the different areas that I think you probably need. Maybe I'll get to map it out. Maybe that'd be a good idea <laughs> is I'll draw it all out. Uh, maybe I should create a little leap. Maybe I should stand in front of a camera and wave my camera around with my lens cap on and say, I've got the answer for you. I don't. I don't have the answer. I've just spotted some things that are consistent with people who are successful. Energy, optimism, enthusiasm and confidence but you'll also need some other stuff. And one of them is just hard work over a period of time. Call it practice, call it graft, call it whatever you want. It's doing it over a long period of time so that you have your chops down. You you graft at it. You'll get some breaks. You'll miss some breaks. You'll have a bit of good luck. You'll have a little bit of bad luck. That's life. There isn't a silver bullet for this, and you really do need to plough through it. So these little ads that come up and say, I've got the answer for you in the next three weeks, you can do this. Um, then just, I'm just doubtful. I certainly don't buy into them. And every time I have sort of investigated, uh, they've come up short. Now we all have superpowers, we do. But we don't all have the same superpowers. And there's no one superpower you need. You need a suite of them, but you can't have everything. It's just not possible to be good at everything. Um, my superpowers, I suppose, are I am a grafter. I work hard. I can read light. I love, I love technology. <laughs> it's a, I know it's slightly ironic that I'm muttering about some of the AI stuff, given I've got a PhD in AI. I adore technology. And I get on with people. Well, mostly I get on with people. But I am not, for instance, an avant-garde creative photographer. I'm not edgy. I'm not a visionary. <laughs> I'm certainly not a master of marketing or of sales. I'm none of those things, but I work hard at it. I love doing it. And so I do a lot of it. And I particularly love being amongst people. And I love being amongst people when I've got a camera. And if I'm, I suppose, I th if I think about it, I can create a portrait in almost 
any light. If I can see it, well, probably I can use it. Those are my superpowers, but everyone will have different superpowers. Some of you will be amazing at business. Some of us will be amazing at marketing and sales. Some of us will be amazing photoshoppers and fine artists, things that I'm not. Um, but that's my superpower. Those are my superpowers. Uh, I'm a grafter, I can read light, love tech, and I get on well with people. But even then, in and of itself, that's not enough. It's a damn good start, but it's not enough. I've got to learn, and I have learned as much as I can about everything else. I'm still learning. I'm still on that journey. We're still running a business. And I've learned how to do it alongside Sarah, Sarah and myself. We've worked out how to do it. We've had a corporate background, so we were exposed to the fundamental principles of running businesses, which is really useful. But I've learned how to run our little business, how to sell. We've learned how to sell stuff. We've learned how to market. We've learned how to do those things using what I would consider to be natural tools. Um, so using the, the superpowers that we have, the ability to get on well with people, the ability to create a picture. Actually, after that, you don't need to do too much on the sales side. A couple of little bits and pieces. There are techniques. But for us, we've just lent into our natural talents um, of really liking our clients and really enjoying being there with them and really enjoying creating images of them. Uh, and so that's how we've learned how to run a business. And we're still learning. But I do wish I could stop receiving ads from people waving a camera at me, telling me that they, all 25 years old of them, are the answer. Well, they may be the answer, but they're not the answer that I would look for. They can't change my business. Only I can change my business. And I'm very, very picky about who I take advice from. Anyway, thank you for listening. <laughs> if you have enjoyed this, please do let us know. Please do leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is you get your podcast. And also please do subscribe. So the minute we publish the next one, bang, <laughs> there it is in your in-tray or in your list or in your library or in your latest or on your alerts or wherever it is that it pings up when you listen to your podcasts. Please also head over to masteringportraitphotography.com, which is the spiritual home of this podcast, but also, of course, includes a ton of stuff all about the love, the passion, the creativity and the business of mastering portrait photography. If you're curious about any of the workshops and one-on-one -on -one masterclasses that we run and with us a whole suite of them, <laughs> I go back to the thing I said earlier, though, if you think we're the kind of thing you'd like to do, if we're creating pictures that you'd like to learn how to do, and if you think actually you'd like to learn it from us, then please do head over to uh, Paul Wilkins Photography, and there you will find the um, coaching section. But just Google Paul Wilkins Photography Workshops, and you will find us. So on that happy note, I'm going to go, I think, and have a beer in the sunshine with my wife and lament the fact that I've got one very sore big toe. Whatever else you do, be kind to yourself. Take care.